Hey, on this episode, we are speaking with a financial advisor who will help you not get killed in taxes, especially when selling your practice, selling real estate, or preparing for retirement at age 50 plus. And we'll be speaking with Marcus Blanchard, advisor at Focal Point Financial Planning, LLC. And this is Dave Kittle, the Dave Kittle Show. I'm the owner of Concierge Pain Relief, home physical therapy in New York City, and the CEO of the Fieldmaker Group. We're currently speaking with practice owners about partnering or acquiring some or all of their practice in the New York and New Jersey area. Marcus, welcome on. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to have me on the show. Sounds like you're doing a lot of good things. And again, we're, we're here to educate, just like we were talking before the show, here to educate the practice owners on what their options are. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, your your account uh, on LinkedIn caught my attention when the, the headline was, I think it's something like, I help clients not get killed in taxes. And I saw that and I was like, definitely got to have this type of person on the show. So you help practice owners, business owners, that is basically our audience, which are individuals who are looking to kind of learn about this exit sale process. And if they're going to sell their practice, their, their, their healthcare business, and maybe get a million dollars, two, three million dollars, the next thing, which would be is, you know, are they going to get taxed heavily? What are some ways to legally uh, avoid that or, or maybe defer some taxes? We're going to get into all of that before we do about your services and uh, you know how you can, on this episode, kind of describe a little bit of ways that practice owners can kind of start planning and understanding the process. Let's talk about your background and, and how you got to helping the clients that you do. Yeah, absolutely. So like you said at the beginning, you know, I, I'm an advisor at Focal Point Financial Planning. I'm the owner. So it, it does lend some uh, flexibility where I, this is what I specialize in, right? If you're selling a business, you're selling a property, uh, you're over age 15, getting ready to retire. That's, I specialize in you guys. So we've all kind of been on our own journey. And ultimately what led, what led here was, if you don't mind, I'll take maybe just a couple minutes and share uh, kind of what, what got me into this whole world. Sure. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if everybody will think back with me to your first, what felt like to you, you know, your first big decision with money. Okay. So for me, that was around August of 2009. Um, I had just enlisted in the Marine Corps and was going through boot camp, and they, they had given me the the sign up sheet for essentially the government's 401k or TSP for those of you who are familiar. Um, and I just remember looking at that sheet and reading through the questions and thinking to myself, I have no idea what any of this stuff means, not a clue, and that that wasn't a feeling that I liked. Right. Because ultimately, I felt like I was guessing when it came to making what felt like to me at the time was a big decision with my money. OK, so again, looking back, uh, relatively not as many zeros. Right. Uh, it doesn't have a huge, huge impact. But again, it was big money to me at the time. Right. And that's what got me started. Hey, I want to learn how taxes work. I want to learn how what these investments are. How does this all work together? Because you can't look at anything just in a silo. Right. And. As I learned for my own selfish reasons, um, I, I looked around and I saw that everybody around me was kind of in the same position I was previously, uh, but they were oftentimes dealing with a lot more zeros than I was. They're selling a business or they've saved diligently uh, over their entire career and now they're ready to start pulling down that money. And and people just don't don't know what to do, right? You don't know what you don't know. And with as complex as the tax code is, that's just where I decided to jump in and focus. And ultimately what led me to start my own firm after working at a couple of different ones to again, just really hone in on a really good client experience. And this is, you know, these are the things that we're gonna work on for people. So that's that's ultimately what led me here is, is it's a big problem, right? Is helping you not feel like you're guessing when making probably the biggest decision with your money in terms of, you know, selling the practice and or retiring, there's a lot of consequences that affect you, not just this year, but 20, 30 years down the road as well. Yeah, for sure. And thank you for your service in the Marine Corps. Uh, I, ha I have heard of some other financial uh, advisors and wealth advisors that it seemed like they have a very similar origin story. Like they kind of got into it because they were in a situation where they didn't understand their own personal finances or they had their family had like a financial, uh, big financial challenge yeah. Uh, and, or, you know, a business that went into bankruptcy or folded or so, something, some financial uh, issue happened that, you know, really shook the family. And then like one of those 
uh, the one of the son or daughters like ends up as like a financial advisor. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yep. So in terms of what you're doing now at Focal Point Financial Planning, we're going to talk about a couple things, but really it's to kind of connect with the audience. If the audience of practice owners, if they're looking to sell in the next year or two, some mm -hmm. maybe in the next three to five years, we're going to kind of get into some nuance and, and all that. Sure. When should a business owner or, or seller contact you about learning more about, we're going to get into like trusts and, you know, we're going to get into all of that, but like, is it ever too early? Do they need to, you know, get into the point where they're actually having, you know, speaking with buyers and, and getting offers or should they have a conversation with you maybe a year or two or, or several years in advance? Uh, that's a good question because preferably before closing, I know that sounds crazy, but that's that's usually when most business owners think about taxes is once that bomb has already been dropped. And, you know, much like gravity, once you let go of it, it there's there's no taking it back. OK, so definitely at least a couple months before closing. OK, the, the more time, the better. Right. If if you're if you're several years out from selling, it's maybe less important. It, it's good to have at least an introductory conversation just to to get the wheels turning about what do you actually want to do with the money? Because that's ultimately what it all leads back to. You know, if same strategy isn't going to be uh, the right one for every situation and for every person's preferences. So yeah, at, at least a few months before the sale closes, please, please, please <laughs> think about it before closing. And if you're thinking about selling, it, it's probably st time to start thinking about what are you going to do with the money? What do you need it to do? And then that helps us build build the path from that point. Got it. Uh, yeah. wanna just, I want to list a couple of questions and things to kind of frame the, we'll, we'll do like a little bit of a, um, an anecdote or a little you know, mini case study. What we're sure. going to cover is, uh, so where do owners go wrong in the planning process, mm -hmm. potential strategies that they could use or consider using, and then also that retirement piece of you know selling your business versus easing into retirement. So those are those are some things as some you know like a theme going forward. So if a, a physical therapy practice owner sells their practice, let's say they get two or three million dollars from the sale, yeah. they're selling they they might sell 70, 80, or 100 percent of the equity of their practice. Yeah. Um, and then depending on the way the structure the deal is structured, they might get you know 90 percent or hundred percent, but it, it's typically like a 10% hold back for 12 months. So they might get 90% of the total cash at the close, regardless of the deal structure. Let's just say if they get two or $3 million on the date of close, if they don't, if they just don't do anything with financial planning, they're going to be taxed. I think in the pre-interview, you said it would be like a six figure tax bill. So they're going to be taxed fairly heavily, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. High six figures. High six figures. Mm -hmm. So closer to or like 500 grand or above? Uh, above. Typically seven to eight. Kind of depends on what state you're in, right? Because there's right. a state tax right. component to that. But uh, yeah, seven to 850, 900 is pretty commonplace. If you're selling a business for two to $3 million. Yeah. It, Got it. It hurts. So that's a tough yeah, bill that, to swallow. That that's a big that's a big tax bill off the, you know, percentage of the total purchase right. price that would be wired to their account mm -hmm. on the date of closing. So, how can they potentially legally avoid that? <laughs> right, that's the key. We're not trying to do anything offshore or any, or anything crazy like that. And and also just to just to get that out there, I am not a tax preparer. You know, I I'm a advisor. And that's why it's important to have a team, right? You have the business broker, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but someone transacting the deal, uh, you have hopefully your advisor, your tax repair, and then depending on the amount, it, it's also good to include a tax attorney as well. So with that being said, right, those disclaimers out of the way, tax planning is really nothing more than deferring the income when your taxes are high, and then later paying the income when your taxes are lower. In the future, okay, that, that at an extremely high level, thirty thousand foot view, that is what tax planning is. Okay, it's not that uh, we can wave a magic wand to make taxes disappear. I'm on your side, guys. I get it. If we could, we would. So one of the strategies that, that we can use, you know, starting off, and that you probably see a lot in transactions that you do, Dave, 
is uh, an installment sale or seller financing, right? So for any of you out there who aren't familiar with what that is, uh, basically it's saying, okay, I am not going to receive $3 million now. I'm going to spread that out over a, a period of some time, right? A couple of years usually. Okay. So that's that's the the kind of first area to look in terms of deferring that tax payment. Okay, usually there's some sort of interest rate attached to that as well. Um, depending on the dollar amounts, that can do a couple of things for you. One, you know, again, it's going to keep you from getting spiked into that very top tax bracket, which is what we want to avoid. It's again, it's not that taxes won't be paid, but uh, I feel like a lot of people are a lot more reactive when it comes to taxes. And they feel like taxes are just happening to them and they don't know why. Doing some planning and having these conversations beforehand really turns that on its head. And it lets you become more proactive with your taxes. Because again, if you know it's coming, you can prepare for it and not overpay the IRS. So overpaying the, the IRS doesn't make you any more patriotic than your neighbor. Okay, I, I'm sorry it doesn't. So let's just try and keep more of those dollars in your pocket. Coming back to your question, sorry, it was kind of a roundabout uh, way to get there. Uh, the installment sale is one one way. Um, however, if you're dealing with a large multi-million dollar sale, you know, if if you spread three million dollars over three years, you're still spiked in the top tax bracket. You know, you're also technically still tied to the credit risk of the buyer for that remaining period of time. So if you are getting, you know, 90, 80, 100 percent of the the sales proceeds up front, you can take that installment sale. A, a step further and look into investigating something called a deferred sales trust. Um, it, essentially, it's, it's a fancy installment sale, but it's using a third-party trust that is specifically crafted for this transaction. Okay, So you, you get to defer the taxes that way. And in this transaction, you are the bank. So again, this, this all needs to happen before closing. But uh, essentially, what you're saying is, okay, trust, um, I'm going to transfer the business to you, and then the trust will complete closing uh, with the buyer. Okay. So that, that what we're trying to do is again, keep you at arm's length so that you don't have to pay taxes because you pay taxes on money when you receive it in your name. Right. Just like with real estate for, for any real estate investors out there, that's why a 1031 exchange works, right? You don't actually receive the money. You use a, the bank or an intermediary to then turn around and reinvest for you. That's kind of what, the, I mean, it's a different piece of tax code. Okay. But that's essentially what we're doing is we're, we're using a trust to maintain that arm's distance and then set up the, the installment note on, on your terms. Because again, you as the seller are the bank, so you get to set the terms. So that's, that's one way. I mean, it, there's, there's a whole rabbit hole that we can go down on that, which, which, which I'm happy to. But uh, that's a very common scenario that this strategy ends up uh, fitting pretty well. So it's... It's not that the taxes won't be paid. You you said mm -hmm. in the pre-interview it's it's more of like a this is like a a different option or or a proactive option, right? Exactly. Right. So, you know, once once the deal closes, you let, let's just say that you sell your business for three million dollars. Okay. And you have nine hundred thousand dollars of taxes you have to pay. Again, just as an example. Option A is you can do what you were probably just gonna do anyway and receive all the proceeds in year one pay the taxes and you're left with 2.1, okay? You're, you're still doing pretty good, right? If you can defer those taxes, now you have potentially, you know, just under an extra $900,000 in this example that you can use to reinvest and generate interest for yourself. So you're using Uncle Sam's tax payment to generate additional interest for you, which most people really like the idea. But again, you know, to your point, it's not that taxes will never be paid. So payments do need to happen. So this really, I'm looking for three things where, where this makes sense to at least investigate. You know, one, there has to be a large enough capital gain. So again, typically transactions, one to $10 million, that's going to be kind of first box to check. Okay. Is there enough taxes where this is really going to hurt? Second one is, do you need income? Right. So if you are selling the practice and transitioning into retirement for the next year or two, okay. That makes sense because again, it's a seller financing or an installment sale. Payments have to be made at some point. You can't just defer everything forever. It just doesn't work like that, right? Uh, and then the third thing is just diversifying and protecting that wealth, right? You're, you're selling a very concentrated asset that's 
that that's been your cash cow. And you're starting to move into a different phase of life where maybe protecting and diversifying that wealth now is more the priority. So those are kind of the three big things that, that we look for um, to see if it makes sense to at least continue having a conversation. Got it. And, and you had mentioned that this is typically a 10-year note. So does that mean it's like a 10-year lockup period where they can't touch that cash? Uh, great question. So again, they the seller, the seller is the bank. So you set the terms of the note. Typically, they're set up for 10-year terms. But, you know, if, let's say year five, you decide, hey, you know what? Uh, we're just going to call the note due and we're going to take whatever's remaining in the trust as a full lump sum. That's fine, right? You can call that that debt due, that note, and the, the trust will pay everything out to you. So but, but, again, you know, be a tax you, event there. Yes, because again, you pay money on or you pay taxes on money when you receive it. So that's that's the thing, right? There, there's there's no free lunch, but there is flexibility. Nobody's locked into anything. And also the trustee and myself as the advisor aren't going to invest the money in a way that you're uncomfortable with. Okay. So if you if you just really want to protect it and just say, give me the interest only, okay, we'll we'll keep it really conservative for you. Okay. If you want to try and grow that balance. So at the end of 10 years, you're using the growth to pay those taxes for you. Um, okay, well, we're, we're going to invest that a little bit differently too. I um, mean, if at the end of 10 years, you decide, bah, let's keep kicking the can down the road, you guys have the option of re essentially refinancing that note into another 10-year term. So, and again, that's, that's uh, I don't, <laughs> so again, I don't draft any of the trusts um, or any of that. That's the tax attorney's job. And with the tax attorney, they're, they're really great. This is all they do. Right. This is their bread and butter. They've seen pretty much any kind of deal that, that you could think up. And they're really going to be the ones that can cr help you craft it to the way that you want. Right. If you want $100,000 a year, okay, great. You know, it's a lot easier to generate that income with $3 million than it is with 2.1, going back to our previous just off the cuff example. Right. 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 So, so, so in this deferred sales trust, the, the, in the pre-interview, you were mentioning that the trust reinvests these funds in the seller's choice of index funds, mutual funds, it could be real estate, which is why it probably makes more sense for them to go the route of this type of a deferred trust, a deferred sales trust, as opposed to their taxed multiple six figures, high six figures from this example, the three right. million sale, they get taxed multiple six figures, they're left with 2.1 million, and then they're going to probably not just put that money in a bank account somewhere or multiple bank accounts. They're going to probably reinvest it in index funds, mutual funds, maybe real estate, maybe invest in small businesses, other projects, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's why it would make more sense to go this potential route of this deferred sales trust, mm -hmm. which is like you said, kind of like kicking the can down the road and minimizing the tax burden. Going back to the theme of this whole talk, which is how to not get killed by taxes. Exactly. Yep. Because it, it really all comes back to, you know, not unnecessarily getting spiked into tax brackets that you don't need to be in. Right. Um, and, and one caveat on the investments, right. It's, it does have to be a reasonable investment. So if you want to put everything into Bitcoin, uh, it's probably not going to work. Right. On the other end of the coin, you know, if you, uh, if you want to buy, take, you know, all the proceeds, let's say, and buy a primary home or a vacation home, that's also not going to work. Because that's a that's a, an asset that you are using. It doesn't really have an investment purpose. Um, and if you are just like if you if anybody is familiar with self directed IRAs or real estate in IRAs, if you touch it or you know are involved in it, it, it blows everything up. Okay. So again, this just like any strategy, it's hey, we want to find the right fit, right? And and this doesn't necessarily the right fit for everything. But again, if you are selling a business for over a million dollars and you are getting ready to retire and you need income oftentimes makes sense for what people are looking to do. Yeah. So right. we were, I don't know if we went into it too deep, but mm -hmm. how this is a good fit for people who need income. So they, they're getting income from the interest only. And then the rest of that money is kind of held in that trust and they're, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's there, but they're not typically, they're not really using it. So are they mostly getting income from the interest? How would this be a good fit for someone who yeah. they have that, they made their nest egg, they got that amount with the sale, but then they would still need some income. Let's say if they're not working, they're not going to be treating patients. They're mm -hmm. no longer working. So they would maybe look for some amount of income. How and yeah. why would this be a good fit for them? 
Yeah. So, so again, it, it comes back to what kind of terms that you want to establish with the trust and the trustee. Okay. So it, it, in terms of your, your question of, do I get interest only or do I get a portion or, or what happens to it? That's totally up to you guys. So if you say, I want just interest only payments, then yeah, you know, your, your uh, nest egg, uh, initial sales price will just sit there and, and generate interest and we'll pay out whatever interest it generates. Okay. If you want pieces of that principal from that sale as well, well we can distribute that as well. So it, it just, it comes down to a mix of what did the trust generate that year versus what was withdrawn. So if the trust generated, uh, you know, $150,000 of interest and you withdrew 200,000, then you would show, you know, on your tax return, you get a 1099 for $150,000 of interest. And then fifty thousand dollars of, you know, usually long term capital gain, so which is taxed more favorably. So if we can, it just depends on what you want to do, right? If you want to pay the taxes now, if you're worried about, actually, this this is a good example. If you are worried about taxes increasing in the future, you know, it makes sense to start thinking about okay, maybe I pay a little bit more tax now, right? Is still being mindful of the tax brackets, of course you would probably receive more of that principle up front than someone who just says, you know what, just, just let it ride. I just want the interest and kind of create a, a generational wealth type of thing. So again, it, it really just comes down to what do you want to do with the money? Cause that's, that's some step one, most important thing. There's a million different ways we can slice this pie, but what do you want to do with it? But so, sorry, that was a, a again, <laughs> kind of a long roundabout answer to your question, but I, I hope that answered it. I, as we speak with different practice owners in the continuum of like how serious they are about potentially mm -hmm. exiting or selling some or all their practice, sometimes we do talk about that. And then all these different owners, obviously without mentioning any names, but you know, they, they've all say, they'll say, you know, similar things. They want to spend more time with their kids, their grandchildren. They want to travel more. But sometimes I try to because then I could maybe work a more favorable deal for them and us. Like if maybe they're going to take more seller finance, I'm not, I've never, maybe in the future, I'll, you can coach me and uh, <laughs> I can you know, talk with them more about, you know, the trust. And, and I'm not sure, maybe that'll be the next question of, are these trusts beneficial at all for me to mention to the seller uh, or not? But um, these are some of the things like we, we haven't gone too far deep in the conversation mm -hmm. with some of these potential sellers about like, where, like, what are they going to do with the money? Because mm. maybe it's, maybe it's out of the conversation of the buyer seller conversation, um, sure. but it's still, it still could be relevant. Oh yeah, absolutely. Cause uh, really, I mean, most people that I've met, nobody builds this pile of money just for the sake of having a pile of money. Right. What, what are the, the main reasons? Like safety net, like comfortability? Right, yeah, safety, charity. you know, just, just having that peace of mind or they want, maybe they're more charitable. They, they want to spend more time working for nonprofits and doing stuff, but and this income can help support that. It's just, what, what do you want to do? You know, especially when it comes to retirement, it's, it, it's the next phase of life. You know, I, it, I don't think about it in maybe the traditional sense. Um, and, and I think a lot of your, your listeners can, can uh, we'll, we'll get this where, you know, you're not going to sit on the couch and watch TV all day, you know, retirement. I, the way I think about it is it's the, this term from the industrial era where you worked on an assembly line and you were literally retired and replaced with a newer model, right? Um, that, that, that's not how the world works anymore. So you still have a lot of good years, right? You're, you have a lot of knowledge and you have a lot of passions and things that you want to explore. So when it comes to retirement and, shifting that or your, or maybe financial independence is a better, better term for it. You know, we want to make sure that you keep the three C's, which are going to be creativity, connection, and contribution. Okay. That's, that's what keeps you, that's what keeps people going, right? You, you need to be creative. You need to be connected to something. Uh, you need to feel like you're contributing to something. And that is totally up to you. That's the nice thing is this, this next step is hundred percent. The ball is in your court. Do what you want. My job is to kind of defend and, and block for you about things that, again, probably don't interest you. Taxes interest you, but the reason why is, is maybe less so. Because especially when you're starting to phase into retirement, we have some other taxes and income levels that we need to watch, you know, especially when we're looking at Social Security. Um, do you have other retirement accounts that are tax deferred, like an IRA or a 401k? 
uh, because that may be, you know, you may be sitting on a tax torpedo 10, 20 years down the road. And at that point, it's too late, right? What, what do we need to do now to prevent you getting killed in taxes later? Same thing with Medicare, right? If, you, if your income is above a certain level, then your Medicare premiums uh, go up as well. So the, that's the stuff that we want to watch for, that I watch for, while you can focus on you know, the connection, the creativity, um, the contribution, that aspect of life. And the contribution would be either charitable contributions or it could be just contributing to your neighborhood, your just, organization. Yeah, like how do you contribute to the lives of others, right? You know, you, they were physicians. You know, that, that's a big contribution, right? And, and a lot of people have trouble with that transition, right? So maybe that's spending more time with grandkids or your kids or just stuff like that. Right. Can we just go back to, so you said the example of the, uh, they draw down 200K from this hypothetical trust. You said maybe sure. 150K came from the interest. 50K mm -hmm. came from the principal. Right. And you said the the 50K coming from the principal would be long-term capital gains. So that's taxed lower than what was Ordin the tax rate of the interest. Right. Yeah. Because interest is ordinary income. Uh, long-term capital gains is, historically speaking, has always been lower than your your normal income which is good. That's what we like. You know, if your income is low enough, it even goes down to the 0% bracket. Um, but most people are going to be in uh, the 15% bracket for capital gains. Right. And, and really, it just depends, uh, like so much of the nuance, which is how much they actually need to live on or have an extra amount of income for traveling, whatever expenses, yeah. you know, like you said, charitable giving, whatever, whatever it might be, as well as it depends on like the size of the original dollar amount of like the business right. or the practice that they actually sold. That's, you know, a huge part of it. And, and really like their goals of like, where, the, where do they want to go travel, whatever. And like, how much does that all cost? Like living expenses, like quality of life, right. all that, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you can defer those taxes, again, you're deferring Uncle Sam's tax payment and you are using that extra money to generate additional interest for yourself, to fund those goals, to fund those, whatever that next step, whatever that next chapter looks like. It's always easier to fund that amount if you have more money, right? Got it. Yeah. So with clients that are, let's say, you know, small business owners, they're going to sell or make a couple mm -hmm. million bucks. Are there other trust options for them? Like I, I've heard of irrevocable trust, which like sounds a, a lot scarier. It sounds <laughs> like like uh, you can't really touch it. I don't know. Do you have uh, other like trust options or like this sure. one sounds like your go-to, but like, are there other ones depending on their situation and, and like their, you know, their, their lives? Yeah, absolutely. So if they want more of the money up front um, or, or however, you know, there, there are other, Trust that you can use, like uh, like a Nevada trust. Um, we're you know working with a competent tax attorney, of course, to determine if that's a good fit. But using a trust like that helps solve the the state tax problem. So if you are in California or Oregon, where you have a really high state tax, you can use a Nevada trust to again kind of a similar process for step one is you shift the asset to that trust, and then the trust sells it. So you're only paying federal capital gains and you are not paying state capital gains. That's, that's the idea of how it works um, from a trust. I mean, there's, you know, and working with a, a competent estate attorney, you know, there's a bunch of different trusts that you can use, but that's more of planning around after you're gone, <laughs> which some people care a lot about. They say, Hey, I want to pass these assets on to my heirs and I want to try and minimize taxes for them. Other people say, you know what? I don't care about them. This is my money. I built it. I, you know, I want my last check to bounce. So right. it, it just, again, it, it depends on what you're looking to do, but you know, Nevada trust going back to your question. That's, that's one option. You know, just if it's a, maybe a, a deal under a million dollars, just normal seller financing or an installment sale, just a standard one that that'll probably work out pretty good. You know, if you want to put funds into real estate, there's uh, opportunity zone funds that help you defer that tax for a little bit. Uh, so th th there's a, there's a lot of stuff, and again, that's that's part of why I started my firm, right? I I don't get paid to to pitch products, right? It's it's advice that I'm giving you on an ongoing basis. So I'm not tied to any one company's, you know, suite of hey, these are our funds and these are our options. But if it's outside of that, mm, sorry, that's uh, I don't love that, you know, especially when it comes to choosing investments. There are are a couple different factors 
that that you need to consider. And this doesn't matter if you're working with an advisor or just choosing your next investment. Just these these things apply to everything. Um, you know, first one's going to be fees. Fees are important, but they're not everything. Uh, in general, if we can keep fees as low as possible, do it. Right. Uh, the second is going to be taxes. Uh, again, we've been talking a lot about taxes now. You, you always want to factor taxes into that conversation. Um, and then risk, all right? What is this? Is this actually something that you're comfortable with? You know, do you want to do a real estate deal where your money's tied up for 10 years or do you value having liquidity more? So there's, you know, there's a lot of different factors to weigh. But if you go back to those, that, that, that's really what all your investments circle around. And then, I'm sorry, the last one is the rate of return or expected return, right? We, we, so expected return, fees, taxes, and risk. Those are the four key areas you need to consider in any investment decision that you make. Yeah, of course. Now, this would be, so your fees, the tax attorney fees, um, any other, you know, maybe, I guess, you're, would they need an accountant for this as well, separate from their current accountant? Like, what are, what are the potential other professionals and, you know, fee yeah. involvement here? Sure. So you, you definitely want a team. Um, one of the things that I that I I don't want to say harp on, but I, I do because I see it happen so many times where you have a lot of professionals in your life and they're all, you know, trying to work and, and do good work for you, but they don't communicate. OK, so especially around a business sale, your tax preparer, your CPA needs to be involved. Your advisor needs to be involved. If you're using a business broker and, you know, the tax attorney, if you're using one for that stuff, right? They all need to be on the same page. So, and sometimes there's, there's some education that needs to happen between parties. You know, I, I work with, I try and work very closely with all my clients, tax preparers, because of all the mistakes that I see along the way, because of just simple, either something wasn't communicated or it was miscommunicated. It's a really easy, just low hanging fruit to help prevent a lot of tax errors. So, for example, I review every client's tax return. Um, again, I don't prepare tax returns. I'm not a CPA. I'm not a tax preparer, but I do review it. it it's actually mandatory uh, for my clients, mainly for two reasons. One is to help catch errors. Um, sometimes on the tax preparer side, just because, again, you, you have to remember they're doing hundreds of returns in a very short amount of time. Okay, And also, the, the tax preparer is a little bit on the back foot because they don't know about something until it's already happened typically, or they didn't get the documentation that they needed. So if they don't have the information, they can't account for it. So that's the first reason is, hey, how can we spot those mistakes and help you not waste taxes that you didn't have to pay? The second is to plan into the future. Okay, so I, I take what's already happened. It's very important to keep score, right? Have an accurate tax return. And then, you know, what about 10 years later? What about 20 years later? Right? What kind of tax landmines may be on the horizon that we need to be thinking about? So I can't do that just in a silo. Coming back to, to the point that we were, we were talking about, of this is a, a team effort. So make sure that all of your professionals are communicating and working together for your benefit. Right. Awesome. Now, you're mentioning seller finance, and I want to make sure that we're speaking about this like, or, you know, the same thing or similar terms. So for us, let's say really easy example, if we're going to buy a physical therapy practice and if the seller agrees to 20% seller finance, let's say we agree to a million dollar purchase price, mm -hmm. we're going to pay them $800,000 on the day to close. And then they're going to hold a note for 20%. So 200 grand. And we would also negotiate like, when's that going to be paid back? It could be two years. It could be over five or seven years. Like, right. And, so that 20% seller finance, which is like, you know, backed by the strength of the business. So we're going to, obviously we don't, we want to grow the business. We mm -hmm. are not going to drive the business into the ground. And over time, over the two years, five years, seven years, whatever, we'll make monthly or quarterly payments that we all agree to mm -hmm. on that 20% with some interest rate right. to that seller. Now you're mentioning seller finance. Are we talking about something similar or a different scenario of seller finance? No, that's the same thing. Because again, essentially it's saying, I'm not going to receive the lump sum. I'm going to receive a series of payments over some period of time. So, got it. Okay. So we're, we're talking the same thing there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Th this is really, uh, really great to hear. I know that this will be helpful for practice owners and, uh, and, and therapists and healthcare individuals that watch the show and listen to the show. So, 
Uh, Marcus, this was great. Um, what would be a good place for the audience to reach out to you, whether your website, LinkedIn, email address, uh, what's a good place for the audience to reach out to you if they want to contact you, learn more about your services and, uh, and speak with you? Yeah, absolutely. So the website is always a good place to start. Um, I've got things to, spelled out pretty plainly so you can poke around, see if anything interests you. I also have a capital gains analysis tab. So if you are you know, in the in the midst of a deal or, or starting down that path and you aren't really sure what that looks like, you can submit an analysis, uh, you know, just high level, and we can go over together to, to look at what the damage is and maybe here's a couple options to look into. So website, number one, uh, I, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So again, if you just want to see uh, what I'm, what I'm talking about, what I'm thinking about. Um, but I, I, that's that's really all I talk about is taxes and retirement. Uh, how do we plan around investments um, around the sale of business and as you're getting ready to retire? So check out my LinkedIn. Go to the website. Those are those are two pretty good places to start. Awesome. And the website is focalpointplanning.com. That's right. And Marcus Blanchard on LinkedIn, right? Mm -hmm. You got it. Excellent. So. Uh, if, if everyone finds this interesting or helpful or insightful, go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube, get notified of future episodes like this, that you'll be uh, alerted when they go published and uh, they go to the public interwebs. And uh, Marcus, really appreciate your time, your expertise. And uh, like I said, I think maybe it'll make sense to maybe have you back in the future. We could do like some, you know, redacted case study with some numbers on a spreadsheet and kind of yeah. go from like that initial, you know, 30,000 foot view and mm -hmm. kind of getting into like the nitty gritty of like some of the possibilities with right. this type of uh, deferred sales trust. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Thanks for having me on, Dave. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. Shoot me an email at dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D-A-V-E at C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, painrelief.com. Or you can call me at any time, 646-781-8884.